My name is Kanika Anand and I'm the Associate Curator at Contemporary Calgary, also overseeing public programs and engagements. Um, I'd like to begin by honoring and acknowledging that we live, work and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, the Gainai, the Pikani, the Satina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Miti Nation Region 3, and all the people who make their homes here in Treaty 7. We also acknowledge that our, our immediate proximity to the Bow River, a site that resonates with us all today and with indigenous populations for thousands of years. Um, before I make a formal introduction to Maya, I'd like to uh, uh, ask her to maybe come back on screen. So um, video on Maya, and then I'll make an introduction and hand it over to you. Hi, Maya. Hello. <laughs> um, so Maya Bordry is based in Vancouver. Um, she received a BFA from Emily Carr University of Art and Design in 2013 and an MFA from the California Institute of the Arts in 2017. She has exhibited work in Canada, the United States, Germany, and France with solo exhibitions in Berlin and Marseille. She was the recipient of the Natish, the Natch, oh, goodness, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a tongue twister. Natishin um, Foundation, William and Meredith Son Saunderson Prize for em Emerging Artists. The Felix Gonzalez Torres Foundation Travel Grant, the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts, CD Howie Award, and has pas participated in residencies at Triangle France and Marseille and September Spring at the KC Forum. Um, she currently has uh, a, a solo exhibition on at Contemporary Calgary, um, a work called The Pargola, which she will be discussing today. So welcome, Maya. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and yeah, over to you. Um, thank you everyone for coming to the talk. It's nice to um, see so many friendly names in the list over there. Um, I'm kind of just gonna launch into this thing because the presentation is pretty thorough and it sort of covers like introductory info. Um, so I'm going to share the screen. I also, there's quite a bit of text in the presentation. And so if you're watching it on a phone or something, it might be a little bit difficult. So if you want me to slow down or like read more out loud, you can just put that into the chat over here. Um, okay, so I'm going to share the screen. Here we go. Okay, so actually, never mind. I won't be able to see the chat while I do this. Um, but okay, so um, rather than situating this work in like a contemporary art conversation, um, I wanted to just sort of go through like the story of how this work came to be in the world um, and kind of just like this idea of personal mythology and like myth making, world building, etc. Um, so these are kind of like uh, what I think are maybe building blocks for a personal mythology. Um, you have an origin story, um, some kind of crisis or moment of um, severe change. Um, and then for me, it was like, uh, a sort of like web of superstitions and coincidences and patterns that sort of develop out of that crisis. Um, and then maybe a belief system to give an order to the superstitions. Um, and then some burning questions, things that keep you up at night, questions that feel unanswerable or too big, maybe. Um, something that you can sort of use this apparatus that you're developing to like kind of um, test things out. And then um, something to like externalize all of this internal uh, world and something to root you in the physical environment and in the world um, and to kind of make this like internal stuff come to fruition. 
Um, okay, and so I'm just gonna like use these structures to uh, take you through my life, how I came to this work. Um, I'm gonna go through um, my sort of like belief systems and then we'll take, we'll go into the practice and talk about the work itself. Um, okay, so origin story. That's a picture of me and my parents. I was born in 1988. Um, I was born and I grew up on unceded land, specifically the southwest corner of the municipality of Vancouver where it borders on the Musqueam Nation. Um, <clears throat> that's a picture from Google of the house that I grew up in. I come from a long line of settlers. I grew up super privileged. I went to private school. I had a really beautiful, nurturing childhood. Um, and then in 2009, things changed uh, really significantly for me. Um, uh, I had just turned 21 at the time um, and I, um, I'll just let some of this stuff come up on the screen here. Um, and so for anyone who has experience with like grief and death and stuff, um, I think you'd probably be familiar with like this kind of phenomenon that happens where you sort of go into like a really hyper present state. Um, things around me started to take on like a really uh, charge kind of eerie significance. Um, I became really superstitious, a lot of like number things, a lot of just like, just kind of like personal, like coincidences, things like everything got really spooky around this time. Um, and so I had, um, uh, so this was an article that was written about my mom, or this is a little clip from it. Um, I had actually never heard of pattern language before this article came out. Um, it seemed familiar, but I didn't really know anything about it. Um, I went through stuff and sure enough, it was there. And I got really into it as like a thing that I could use. I was I was starting art school at this time. So I was like really looking for things to um, cling to or sort of like stay connected to my mom without making work like explicitly about what had happened or something like that. But I really felt like I had to make work about it. So I'll just read, this is like a basic intro to pattern language. Um, the elements of this language are entities called patterns. Each pattern describes a problem which occurs over and over in the built environment, over and over again in our environment. And then describes the core of the solution to that problem in such a way that you can use the solution a million times over without ever doing it the same way twice. And there are 253 patterns. Oops. Let me just go back there. Um, And so, yeah, this was just a thing that I just started sort of like grounding a lot of my work in. And just to be clear, like, I don't really feel qualified to like teach a pattern language. There's elements of it that have been used in like computer science and um, stuff like that, that are just sort of beyond my understanding, but I'm just gonna give a really personal kind of run through of my relation to it and the way that it has um, been helpful for me. Um, so Pattern Language is a really elaborate book. It's like almost 2000 pages long. It's one of a series of books. Um, it's very thorough. Um, so we'll just do like a little intro here. A pattern language has the structure of a network. When we use the network of a language, we always use it as a sequence going through the patterns, moving from the larger patterns to the smaller, always from the ones which create structures to the ones which embell then embellish those structures and then to those which embellish the embellishments. Um, and so as you can see here, it starts with like these really large structures, distribution of towns, 
like agricultural valleys, just really big structures and they get smaller and smaller as they go through. Um, and they get really down into like the nitty gritty, how many cars should park in a town, like, and then they go into community stuff. Um, a lot of the stuff is really technical and a lot of it is really poetic. Um, the one thing about pattern language that some people don't like, it's very prescriptive. Like they're not giving suggestions, they're giving orders on how things should be. Um, the book was written in 1977. It has a very hopeful tone. Um, it can be hard to read now because it, we're so far from the things that it hoped to sort of enact in the world. Um, and uh, some are probably no longer possible, but at the time that it was written, it seems like maybe they were. Um, and so I'm going to take us through like a few of my favorite patterns um, and show the way they're structured and the way that they connect. I'm going to start with sleeping in public because I just think it's a very sweet one. Um, it connects to, um, oh yeah, this actually Kayla Efros who wrote the text for the exhibition, she actually referenced this section. Um, this is like a really, good exemplary kind of like pattern language ethos. This comes up again and again. The book is really repetitive stuff. They kind of like really try to drill in these certain uh, <clears throat> ways of thinking. I'm so sorry, Sleeping in Public connects to Building Edge. Um, that connects to Ornament. Ornament is one of my favorite ones. This is the smallest one, Things from Your Life. We're not gonna do that one, but um, it's, very, it's a very sweet, nice one. And so that's kind of the smallest unit that you can have within the environment is like what the stuff is that you put on your walls. And um, okay, so we'll just go through it now. So Sleeping in Public, number 94. So it starts with the title, you get an image, it shows you at the top here, the larger patterns that it connects to. And so these are all the ones that you could co go through them to get to sleeping in public. Um, and so the bold at the beginning of the section tells sort of is like that either states a problem or it states a kind of like truism or a thing that they really believe to be true. And um, so this one here is a mark of success in a public park, lo public lobby or porch when people can come there and fall asleep. Um, and then they sort of go through like their research, they'll maybe like pull something from literature. Some of them are quite long. This one's a short one. Um, if someone lies down on a pavement or a bench and falls asleep, it's possible to treat it seriously as a need. If he has no place to go, then we, the people of the town, can be happy that he at least can sleep, that he can at least sleep on the public paths and benches. Um, and this one's really indicative of like another pattern language ethos is that though we shape the environment, the environment shapes us. and we have to build these things in order that they will sort of um, dictate the way we act within them. And then at the end of the section, they give you their sort of solution for the problem. So this one, um, keep the environment filled with ample benches, comfortable places, corners to sit on the ground or lie in comfort in the sand, make these places relatively sheltered, protected from circulation, perhaps up a step with seats and grass to slump down upon, read the paper and doze off. Um, and then at the end, it connects you to smaller patterns that connect to it. Um, so we're gonna go to that one. And I think this pattern is just really like, this one really shows like how far we are from these ideals, what a different way our cities have gone. Um, and that there's like a, not a different way to think about it. Um, okay, so building edge building edge. So you see here the problem. Um, this one I'm just going to go through and find some things. People prefer being at the edges of open spaces. And when these edges are made human, people cling to them tenaciously. Um, and here's where their things gets like into kind of like esoteric places. An edge is a realm between realms. It increases the connection between inside and outside, encourages the formation of groups which cross the boundary, encourages movement which starts on 
one side and ends on the other and allows activity to be either on or in the boundary itself. Therefore, make sure that you treat the edge of the building as a thing, a place, a zone with volume to it. And crenellating the edge, I thought that was really a nice way to put that. Um, and so the next one is ornament. It kind of seems like I'm cheating because it doesn't actually say ornament here, but as you'll see, this one connects the building edge. So technically they are connected. Um, this one's one of my favorite ones. All people have the instinct to decorate their surroundings. This one's actually quite a bit longer. I had to edit it down just to fit it in here. Um, but this paragraph I love, a thing is only, a thing is whole only when it is in self entire and also joined to its outside to form a larger entity. But this can only happen when the boundary between the two is so thick, so fleshy, so ambiguous that the two are not sharply separated, but can function either as separate entities or as one larger whole, which has no inner cleavage in it. Um, and so this is a nice one for art too. Um, uh, search around the building, find those edges and transitions which need emphasis or extra binding energy. Corners, places where materials meet, door frames, windows, main entrances, the place where one wall meets another. All these are natural places which call out for ornament. Make the ornaments work as seams along the boundaries and edges so that they knit the two sides together and make them one. And so following this, it goes to things from your life, which is the smallest pattern. So here we're like really in the, in the small ones. Um, so that's like a basic run through of how the book works. I've attached, I put the PDF of pattern language in the like supplementary material for this, um, just so that you can have a look at it. I really recommend getting the book. It's like a really kind of a unique reading experience. It's not meant to be experienced linearly. You go back and forth between the different spaces. It's really nice to flip around with it. The PDF is like, you get dizzy from scroll. Um, this is another sort of like more esoteric element of it. Um, there's a central quality, which is the root criterion of life and spirit in a man, a town, a building or a wilderness. This quality is, is objective and precise, but it cannot be named. This is from The Timeless Way of Building, which is a different book than Pattern Language. It's really, it's like more the kind of like manifesto. Um, it's a weird book to read. It's really repetitive. I really like, I got the audio book of it and I really liked it as like, it just sort of washes over you. Um, and you kind of just like, they repeat stuff so much. But the quality without a name is this kind of like, I read stuff about it being described as kind of like a Tao of building or something, but um, it's kind of this like aliveness that these patterns are always aspiring to. Um, the more living patterns there are in a place, a room, a building, or a town, the more it comes to life as an entirety. The more it glows, the more it has that self-maintaining fire, which is the quality without a name. Um, so I've also put this whole slideshow in the, in the other materials too. So if you wanna go slower through this. Um, okay, so that's, a belief system that sort of developed for me as like a really charged thing that I was like discovering. I think the timing of like to when I started art school had something to do with it. Um, and so my burning questions that come out of like those life experiences, um, specifically I think the experience of living in, or not like, sort of living in my mom's house after she died for so many like we kept the house for about a decade um and I really thought about this a lot it's like why can we feel her so deeply here and what is that and how does that work um another burning question that is like just a factor of living maybe in Vancouver or in the world in 2022 is why doesn't every person in this society have somewhere to live? And to be clear, like, I don't think my work answers these questions. I think these are questions that I think about while I make the work. Um, and so they sort of like are in there somewhere, but 
they both kind of boil down to the same thing, which is what is this quality that cannot be named? This relationship between person and architecture, collaboration between human and building, and why is it so vital? And why do we need it? And where is it located materially? Um, these are just some ideas of how to locate it materially. Um, this I would say is something I'm working on. This I would say is something that I don't know how to do. Um, okay, and this is kind of the second part of the talk. This is the practice. Um, so this is the pergola. This is the piece that is on view currently at Contemporary Calgary. Um, so what I've tried to do here is I've tried to basically like pattern language this work. Um, so it breaks down more or less into four elements, which are a lumber structure. Um, so this is four inch by four inch posts. They're six feet tall. These are just standard two by sixes. They're eight feet long. The whole thing's put together really provisionally. It's just a couple of screws. It's got like a real lean on it. If it was gonna be up for more than a month, the whole thing would start to lean dramatically, I think. Um, uh, so that's the, that's the lumber structure. The wire growth, this is made by wrapping, basically I buy uh, bed sheets from Value Village, cut them into strips, and I wrap a thread around them, around wire. And so the, the wire is like this really circular motion. I'm basically taking a spool of wire, a spool of thread and a long strip of fabric and one winds onto the other. As they become the wire, they wind up into a spool and then the actual act of making this thing goes in like this circular motion around. So it has like this real kind of spiral energy to it. Um, and so the way this, a uh, little network is set up that I've done is that if we go to wire growth, then we go to like um, past works that have used this wire technique, um, but we can go back to wire growth here and we can go back to the pergola. Um, another technique I've been working with for a long time is kind of like this idea of embellishment, embellishing the embellishments and all this stuff with, kind of pillowy structure. This could have been called like upholstery too, but I thought this didn't really technically qualify as upholstery because um, it wasn't stapled to anything. But I have like a long standing sort of uh, idea about fabrics and like their kind of role as like a membrane between bodies and architecture and um, the way that they like li quite literally absorb dust and skin cells and everything and like they're really this thing that like we put on our body, we put it on the house and they come together and they meet and where they meet is like on your couch, sort of. That's a, a quick, a quick rundown of that. And so the pillowy thing is something I've been working on for a long time. So you can see all these past works, which we'll go through um, back to the pergola. And then the slip cover is unique because it actually has these past works embedded within it. So there's only two pages of slip cover. Um, so these kind of represent like all these past projects, the way just that like uh, just memories and old ideas can sort of exist in the present. Um, so I'll go through, whoops, I'll go through some of these now. So one of the oldest patterns I've been working with is this Craigslist interiors pattern. Oh yes, and small reference to linear time. I did put the date on the, um, on the past works, just so you can position it sort of like what comes first, whatever. Um, and I do think on the PDF that I attached, the links actually work. So you can also play around in here if you want to. So the Craigslist interiors, um, I think I was just sort of like thinking about the archive of uh, photography on Craigslist and how like there's millions of these photos out there. They have a kind of eerie quality to them. 
this like an unlived in room is a weird feeling. Rooms don't often stay like this for that long. If they do, something's weird about it. Um, so I just sort of started collecting these. Um, this was like a really early piece that I did with the Craigslist fabric. Um, these are some other ones. This one is like Craigslist fabric and oil paint. Um, um, and then the Strathcona house. This was from a house where I had sort of like unusual access to it in between ownership. I had a studio in here. Um, and I just found that the like the life, the amount of life in the house was really significant. There was just so much evidence of living, so many traces of the human in it. Um, this fabric was specifically printed to do this installation, which I actually did while they were actively renovating the house inside. Um, and I'll just show like a couple like maybe a minute of this video. Um, and so you can see here that like, because the Craigslist houses are in it too, and the Strathcona house, so we can go back through here to the Craigslist, to go back to Strathcona house. Okay, so more things from the slipcover. This is, these are some watercolors. This is like just a motif that I kind of have been using in my watercolor painting, um, which I think is like, kind of comes out of that ornament pat that ornament section of pattern language of just like uh just kind of picking a motif and repeating it just to use it and you can build a lot of narrative I think out of motifs and like where they break down and fall apart and where they kind of be key and like strong um okay second page of slipcover um this pattern comes from my dear friend Hannah Acton's family home in Saskatoon, where her family had for many years just let everyone write all over the cabinets. Um, and we this was actually, we made this fabric for her mom, who's a quilter, just as a gift because they were finally going to change the cabinets in there. Um, and I just sort of realized that it just made a lot of sense to my work and I just loved it so much. And so that has worked in. And so this pattern um, was used really extensively in this show, Everything Leaks. Um, these are the bigger works from there. Um, so I will go back 
to you. If I can put it here, um, this brick pattern, that's an older one to um, kind of just a basic uh, plants growing between bricks, which I like. Um, Sublet collage, this is another Craigslist one, uh, this, but this is a little different. This is one specific guy who like runs, I guess a bunch of rooming houses or something. He still actively posts. You could find these photos any day on Craigslist in Vancouver. Um, he just rents rooms out near Langara College here, um, and he has a really specific photography style that I love. Um, where he always has like a naked bed. Um, it's very, it's very chair desk bed. And again, I think it's like these. They have these like feeling of potential. Like, what if I sublet that room? Where would I put my stuff? You know, what would I? Could I sit at that desk? Like, could I sleep in that bed? And um, you sort of like situate yourself in it. Um, this is more of that same one. Um, this mold pattern, I just think is cool. <laughs> um, and yeah, and so these are another like, these are some other pieces that involved like slip covers. This was an installation in a castle in Italy that I did a few years ago. Um, where they had these like Ikea couches in the space. And so I made slip covers for them from photos from the like vacation rental site where the place was posted. And then just showed up and sort of hoped for the best and hoped that it would fit on the couch. And it did. Um, uh, oh yeah, this is another just technique that I used in the that slip cover. Um, this is it's just a really small bit of ink and a lot of water in an airbrush um, on just caught like cotton bed sheets again. Um, and so this technique I've used in these paintings. Um, and yeah, I think that's pretty much this is a really old couch piece that I did for show at the bag in 2016. Um, okay, so the pillow pieces. Um, so yeah, we've seen this one, we saw that one, we've seen that one, that one, uh -huh, the sleeper. This was a part, this is in that, the Calgary show also. Um, it's kind of separate work. Um, oh, I didn't, oh yeah, no, there we go. Um, Oh yes, this was a very pillowy work that I did in Marseille. Um, it was inside this weird box. And so I was just trying to kind of fill out the whole space. Um, mold, oh yeah, molding between, these were two pieces that I did at a space called Ashley Berlin. Um, let me get back to the pergola. The wire growth. We have more wire pieces here. These, this is again using the Strathcona house, the bricks, um, and the pillows. And, no, whoops, went to the pergola. Um, the lumber structure. This is like a work from grad school that kind of had a similar structure to it. Um, this is a work that I did with the artist Graham Landin, um, and so kind of like and like actually trying to build a structure, which is a lot harder. <laughs> um, and yeah, so yeah, this is in the PDF. Um, we can. I can kind of just keep clicking through them to see if there's any that I missed. I think I actually got all of them. And I wanted to end on a video. I guess I'm coming in a little short, actually. I maybe went too fast, but that's okay. Um, I wanted to end on this really old video that I made like just after art school um, or just after my BFA, um, which was one of the first times I used the Craigslist houses. It's just sort of fun. And I thought it would be uplifting because the beginning of the talk was a little heavy.
Okay, that's pretty much it. I'm trying to think if there were any parts we didn't really get to here, but I think we made it through all the work. And so I think to finish up, it's, um, I just maybe want to say, or like try to make it clear that I don't really think this work is like about pattern language or uh, anything like that. I, I really think that it's like what I've gained from just returning to the book often is like a relationship to the ideals of it and like a way of working. And um, when I was working on this, I was listening to the audiobook of The Timeless Way of Building and um, it sort of occurred to me that like it, their real goal is to make a building which is alive. And the kind of like sadness that I feel reading that book is that a lot of the things they put forward aren't really possible, but maybe it could be reread as like a way to just make anything which is alive. And so like stressing connections, stressing borders, edges, boundaries, you're only really as good as your seams. You're only really as good as your joinery. Um, and I think that's kind of a, a decent way to move through the world. Um, I have one last slide because the presentation was 52 pages long. And as I mentioned before, I'm really superstitious with numbers. This was just a video that I like. The link is in the chat. It's an hour long. I get made fun of for loving Terrence McKenna. I think he's the best. And this is just a weird little coincidence at the end. And that's slide number 53. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And so we can op open it up to questions or we can just call it quits. Thanks, Maya. That was really, really interesting. And thank you for also sharing such a deeply personal and traumatic experience. Um, yeah, we, we enjoyed the presentation and um, I think we have a few questions um, already. So Paisley Smith is asking, do you plan to make fabric for the human body, say, for example, swimwear? <laughs> um, I actually do plan to make um, fabric for the human body. I have been sort of commissioned by a friend of mine, uh, a musician who would like me to make touring outfits for her. And so that's kind of my next project. Um, and it is intimidating. Um, clothing, the fit is so specific and it speaks so loudly to so many different references and signifiers and stuff. It can be a very loaded thing to deal with, but I'm going to collaborate with another friend and artist and a very exceptional sewer and pattern maker. And so I'm hoping it will work out. That's great. Um, let, let us know when, when that happens. Um, Peter Edmund asks, uh, ignore this if you've covered it already. I don't think you have directly. Um, but you can you speak a little bit about the color palette in your work? Yeah, I think like the palette for a long time was dictated by the um, um, the photos because I was working with the Craigslist photos and so I was like trying to stay in this really like muddy like washed out space because it was uh it sort of corresponded with those colors nicely and so because of using the photo prints they really dictate a lot of the colors um but then when I get into like the watercolors and the airbrush stuff I think the color stuff gets a little looser and more intuitive um I have a problem when I make a painting. I just like can't make a painting that doesn't include all the colors available to me. Like I really like finding the balance in there. I have a hard time making like something that's green or something that's blue or whatever. And so I think it's like trying to get like the highest density, highest complexity 
of colors and I think like using the photographic fabric as a color is a good way to get that like to get like a real density in the surface um, because we are sort of like inundated with photos all the time and it really is like a color you know like a if you have like a whole bunch of photos and you zoom them down into something it will have like a photographic color to it um, so yeah I don't know if that answers the question <laughs> um yeah I think it does um Alison Kowitz is asking, well, it's more, more a comment. She says, very interesting. I sure would like to check out the book. I have some burning questions myself, and this may shed some light on some repetitive numbers in my life. I will certainly be following up and checking out your links. Thank you for your art. Um, and, Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Ryan Doherty. Some of the slipcover elements remind me of tie-dye psychedelic type patterning. I wonder if the psychedelic informs your practice at all. Yes, definitely. I think, um, well, A, because of the timing of, like particularly when pattern language was built or uh, written, it obviously that's from an era deeply entrenched in the psychedelic. Um, and for me, I think that there was like, I connected to, to a lot of visual elements of that stuff externally, like separate from the book. Um, I think that like the basis of a lot of psychedelic imagery is repetition and mirroring. So it's really actually easy to make something look psychedelic. Uh, no, it's not easy to make something truly psychedelic it's really easy to give something like a psychedelic reference or whatever like you pretty much just just mirror it four ways and it'll give you that um kaleidoscope effect but um i love the sort of maximalism of psychedelia i like the intensity i think like in the realm of image making there's like a couple different kinds of magic the really easy like the really straightforward ones representational imagery it's like the fact that you can paint a picture that looks like a person that's a form of magic and another form of represent or like of image making magic is um is the psychedelic like when something really does something to your eye when you're looking at it like the optical effects um i think that's like a really more powerful structure than we sometimes give it credit for um, if you watch this Terrence McKenna video that I put in at the end, you can see that he is highly informed by the psychedelic. Um, I sort of love that mode of thought and way of thinking about the world. Um, and so the, yeah, the wire structure falls into some of those ideas too. Um. I actually have a, a little bit of a follow up on that as to um, this the whole idea of um, psychedelic patterning also has a link to the subconscious, and I wonder if that is somewhat um, a reference in your work, like a, a gateway of sorts. When when you use it, is it some sort of a reference? Definitely. Like I think. Um... Yeah, the imageries of doors and windows and stuff are pretty like uh, easy references to doorways and uh, like doorways of your mind. And, you know, a lot of this stuff gets a kind of funny rep for maybe not being serious or something, but I think a lot of it is really serious. And I think it's like um, worth, worth treating seriously. Um, I, what was the question about doorways and gates and the psychedelic? Um, I think like in pattern language, they really like a gate is really important. A door is really important. A window, it's all, those are like your connection to the outside. And mm -hmm. so I think psychedelic imagery, imagery uses that stuff a lot because the idea is that you're going somewhere, you're going on a trip, you're like passing through some kind of portal to get somewhere else. And so like, you know, stairways and doors and all that stuff are really important. Um, and so I kind of like to, to use those things because they have 
they have like quick tidy meanings and they also have sort of more expanded ones. Um, yeah, no, that's really, really interesting. Um, Paisley, who asked the question about the Swimberg collaboration right in the beginning, um, has another comment. Uh, <laughs> she says, maybe, uh, maybe they can be slip covers uh, with a smiley. Sounds amazing. Thank you. Well, yes, as a piece of clothing really is just a slip cover for your body. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think um, I have another question that I was kind of just curious about in with the installation at Contemporary Calgary. Um, could you speak to speak a little bit about why you decided to have the sleeper with the pergola and what 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 that really what the relationship between the two means for you um yeah the sleeper was an older work that i had made the year before um and it was like in this kind of lineage of materials um it was sort of just one step before the pergola and sort of seemed like um something that i wanted to include just to sort of maybe reiterate like a I mean, this is sort of like a psychedelic ism too, but of just like we're, that we're all made of the same stuff as our environment, and um, and they just really seemed like they were of the same world. The sleeper actually has like a jacket on, and um, I was thinking of the in like the interior space of garments and clothing, and contrasted with the interior space of an actual structure. Um, the way that the tree structure needs the pergola in order to kind of grow. Um, I, you know, I was thinking about people and I wanted there to be a per like a reference to a person or a figure in it just in order to um, kind of emphasize that. Um, no, and that definitely does come through. There've been people who who have spoken about like the idea of comfort and the idea of discomfort when when looking at the way it is at the gallery, which I find incredibly interesting. Um, and yeah, just to kind of um, out of curiosity, I'm sure our audience is interested as well. What is what is in the works now and what is next? Um, well, right now I'm. I actually have a grant due later today for this project that I do with a group of people called Liquidation World, which um, we did last summer, which was an open submission consignment art store that we're hoping to expand into like a more of a art space, art hub, kind of like community space. Um, so we're just kind of getting that organized now. Hopefully that'll be coming up in the next year or so. Um, and then I have some other shows and projects coming up. I'm doing that, um, as I was saying, the garments for my friend. Um, I think I'll have a show in Vancouver in the spring. Um, but yeah, just keep it on. <laughs> Nice. And um, if people are interested, um, where, I mean, and we, we will share, of course, your, I think we already have shared your um, website um, to follow and your Instagram page so that they can keep updated. Um, but yeah, thank you um, very much for taking the time out. And of course, um, the pergola is on at Contemporary Calgary till the end of the month. Um, so for those who are joining us in from Calgary um, and you haven't already, we really encourage you to visit. Um, yeah, and thank you, Maya, for thank you, um, a really, really interesting presentation. We'll be circulating um, the recording and, of course, the, the few the few resources that um, you put together for us, the PDF and Patent Language book. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. See ya. Bye.